Hello there, I'm Joshua Johnson. It's great to be with you on this Monday, April 18th. And here's some of what we're talking about tonight. Western Ukraine had been somewhat removed from the war until Russian missiles struck the city of Lviv. NBC's Ali Aruzi was there as the attacks got much closer than before. That wasn't a plane, it was a cruise missile. That was a cruise missile. Yeah. Wait for one more, they're fired in yeah, 30 second intervals. They fire them in 30 second intervals. Also this weekend saw yet another string of mass shootings across the U.S. It may seem like violent crime keeps going up, but is it really? And if so, what's behind it? Then you are almost out of time to file your income taxes or get an extension, but taxpayers are not the only ones feeling the crunch. The IRS is too. And missiles that can shoot down satellites. They're not science fiction anymore. We'll explain the Biden administration's new effort to prevent nations like Russia from attacking in orbit. So if you were in Ukraine trying to avoid the worst of Russia's attacks, where would you go? Up to now, Western Ukraine was a good all-purpose answer, but even that is changing. This morning, missiles struck Lviv in Western Ukraine. That city has been something of a safe haven for refugees from across the country. But according to the regional governor, these airstrikes killed seven people and injured 11 others. A child is among the wounded. This appears to be the first time that people in Lviv have been killed since this war began. Its mayor says there are no longer any safe locations in Ukraine. Now, NBC News has not verified the number of casualties, but we absolutely know there was an attack. We were there. Territory. Is that going down? No, but I've never seen a fast mover. I'm wondering whether that was a cruise missile. Did you see the aircraft? No, I never saw them. Are we in an air raid? Yes. Yeah, we are. Okay. We had the air raid. So there's another coming. Wait, there'll be three. Stand by. Striking to the west, that's two. We what should was get that at least plane? one more. That wasn't a plane, it was a cruise missile. That was a cruise missile? Yeah. Wait for one more, they're fired in 30-second yeah, intervals. They fire them in 30-second intervals. Uh, here's this. Smoke. There we go. Stand by. Three, cruise missile, caliber. Look. Stand by. Five. Six, eight, nine, oh, ten, here. eleven. Yeah, there 12, it is. There's the smoke. Thirteen. There's the smoke. Here. That's three. So three cruise missiles. Yeah. That was our correspondent Ali Aruzi. The gentleman in the yellow was analyst Malcolm Nance. But that's not the only bold move that Russia is making right now. Its defense ministry is demanding that Ukraine surrender the southern port city of Mariupol. Russia's forces have all but destroyed it, but Ukrainian soldiers are refusing to lay down their arms. Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, says that his countrymen in Mariupol will, in his words, fight absolutely to the end. NBC's Ali Arusi starts us off from Lviv tonight. And Ali, tell us more about what was going on when you and Malcolm Nance were speaking and then you saw those cruise missiles overhead. Hi, Joshua. That's right. We were doing an interview at about 8.30 uh, this morning, and then we heard a whistling sound above us and then a thump. We weren't quite sure what had happened. By the time the second one flew over our heads, we actually saw it. It was so big. At first, I thought it was an airplane. These things are about 27 feet long. Uh, and then we realized they are cruise missiles. And, you know, it landed less than a mile from when we were standing. Uh, a series of thumps after that. Um, and it was a, a little disconcerting for, for everybody. It's not something we were expecting at 8.30 in the morning in the center of Lviv. And I think that's just the point. The other times that the Russians have uh, targeted the city, it's been on the outskirts. It's been in strategic locations like a fuel dump or an airplane repair factory. But this was bang in the middle of the city. A lot of residential buildings, homes around it. Uh, and one of the targets they hit was an auto repair factory. So yeah, I mean, this, uh, this also shook all the residents of Lviv and many of the people that have come here from the war-torn east of the country.
So how does this change the calculus in terms of where you are? I mean, I, I don't know if it's too broad or too general to say this, but I think we all kind of considered Western Ukraine, vaguely speaking, kind of generally speaking, relatively safer than areas closer to Kiev or Mariupol or Odessa or Dnipro or certainly points further east. But how does this affect all that? Uh, definitely. It, it, it's changed the calculation. It's changed the balance of how people are living here. Look, as you mentioned, this was a place for the waves and waves of displaced people to come from the east, from the center of the country, the north and, and the south. And it was regarded as a safe haven, a refuge. But that sense of safety has now been uh, shattered in Lviv. And this is the first time uh, people have been killed here. Seven people got killed in that missile attack. Amongst them uh, injured was a three-year-old child who had been brought here uh, by their parents from Kharkiv to uh, escape the sh shelling in Kharkiv and, and then got injured by a missile attack uh, here in Lviv. And, you know, like I mentioned, those missile, previous missile attacks were on the outskirts of the city. But this was bang in the middle of the city. It hit an auto repair shop at a time when people would be going about their daily routine. This didn't happen at four in the morning where, where, where an auto repair shop would be empty. This is when people are, you know, tuning up their car, changing their tires. So, you know, the Russians knew exactly what they were doing and the timing of hitting it. They wanted to terrorize the population, send the message that this is no longer a safe place. Now, the Russians said that they also hit a warehouse where uh, the Ukrainians were storing uh, weapons and ammunition given them to the West. That may be true, but they also hit a civilian location. So many people here are not asking, uh, will Lviv be hit again, but asking when it will be hit again. With regard to another place that is dealing with a matter of perhaps if, perhaps when, Mariupol. We mentioned that southern port city. It would be very strategically important to the Russians if they add a port city from which they can attack from the south. What's the best read right now in terms of what becomes of Mariupol. As we can see on the map there, you can see it's kind of at the northeast corner of the Sea of Azov, which kind of has a narrow inlet that flows down into the Black Sea. Ali, what would it mean for this fight if indeed the Russians made a move on Mariupol or if the Ukrainians could hold it? Well, it's, it, it is probably one of the most uh, strategic cities for the Russians in this war. I mean, it uh, opens up into the Sea of Azov, which leads into the Black Sea. Most of uh, Ukraine's exports of coal, steel, corn leave from that port. So it would choke them off financially. It would give the Russians a land bridge from mainland uh, Russia all the way to the Crimea, something that they've desperately wanted. Putin would be able to sell this as a victory through state-owned media uh, in Russia, something he desperately needs. Uh, and if the Ukrainians lost it, it wouldn't just be a political and financial blow to them, but it would be a psychological blow for them. For 55 days, they've been fighting as hard as they can to keep that city. There's only a handful of fighters left in there, but they're determined to hold it. And, you know, the latest reports we have is that the Azov Brigade, a group of very hardened fighters, are at that very important steel factory in there, one of the biggest in Europe. And we've also heard today from Ukrainian authorities that there are several hundred women and children hiding in the, the, the basement areas of that steel factory and you think well there's possibly better places to hide than that seeing as that's where the Russians want to get but there's nowhere left in that city to hide they flattened 90% of that city you know it looks like Aleppo or Grozny so they are desperate and they have to hide in a steel factory where the Azov brigade are fighting the Russians and you know the Russians say that it's only going to be a matter of time before they take that place and the odds are certainly against those fighters in in that uh, in that steel factory but again and again in this war we've seen the Ukrainians defy the odds. So let's see what happens there in the coming days. Indeed. Thank you, Ali. Please stay safe as best you can. That's NBC's Ali Arusi starting us off tonight from Lviv in western Ukraine. Now, as we mentioned, Mariupol is seeing some of this war's fiercest fighting. Its mayor says that nearly 100,000 civilians there are still waiting to be evacuated. About another 100,000 made it out of Mariupol. But where are they now? From our partners at Sky News, Jason Farrell has the story. Underground in the city of Mykolaiv is a bunker that's now a children's ward. Drip feeds and medication are administered among the gloomy basement pipework. 
Oksana's done the best to brighten things up for her two sons, Nikita and Artem, whose toys reflect the battle above. She last spoke to her husband four days ago. He is among some of the last fighters holding out in the pummeled city of Mariupol. How are you coping? The children here are afraid to go above ground. Medics don't want us to locate this place, fearing it would make it a target. A nearby hospital is one of more than 300 in Ukraine that has been shelled, which is a war crime. Here, they've treated 24 children for conflict wounds. Two of them have died. But people in Mykolaiv still have to venture out. There's been no running water in the city for six days. At a mobile supply tanker, we meet a man recovering from a shrapnel wound whose dog was killed in the blast. In a nearby park, blood-stained ground and a discarded cap is the only clue to horror that rained down on civilians outside this church on Friday. Local authorities say several blasts killed five people and injured 15. И представьте то мое состояние, когда я вот это увидела у нее оторванную голову, ребенок вот это без руки, и потом вот этот мужчина, вот это все, это какой-то ужас. Стекла летели с храма, и вот это что творилось. Mykolaiv has held off the Russians, but it is still terrorized by them with missiles and artillery fire. And walking around this city, you just pray that you're not in the wrong place at the wrong time. They pray too for their soldiers, for their dead, and more than anything, for an end to this war. Jason Farrell, Sky News, Mykolaiv. Let us continue now with David Sheffer. He was the first U.S. ambassador at large for war crime issues under President Clinton. And today he is a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. Ambassador, welcome to the program. Good to have you with us. Thank you, Joshua. Glad to be with you. Could I just get your assessment in general, first of all, of what we're seeing in Lviv and Mariupol, particularly as it relates to the human toll of these wars? And in light of the Russian missile attack on Lviv, as we heard from Ali Aruzi earlier, that seems to be kind of changing the situation very dramatically on the ground. It certainly is. And I think after, what, six or seven weeks of this now, perhaps eight, um, we can almost become desensitized to the magnitude of what is occurring. This is truly unprecedented, I think, since World War II in terms of the short period of time during which you see a massive military assault on a civilian population with destruction of property, destruction of life, injury of life, destruction of a society. Um, it, is, it is remarkable that, uh, uh, you know, we, we, it's not questionable that there, there are war crimes and crimes against humanity occurring. It's simply what is the magnitude today of a continuous barrage of such attacks? So what you're seeing in Mariupol, of course, is the sort of final act in the decimation of a civilian population and of the civilian property. We sometimes forget that war crimes include a, a, a wide list of, of acts which are destruction of property. They also, of right. course, include uh, attacking civilians, but 
property also is a large component of war crimes. What about genocide? We've heard the Biden administration in recent days use the G word to describe what's going on in Ukraine. Ukraine's President Zelensky has used the word before. At what point does that distinction matter as opposed to being more academic? We know there are atrocities going on on the ground, but how important is that word, is genocide in the way we view all of this? I think you just made a very important point that we know atrocities are occurring. I've argued for more than 20 years that we need to uh, look at situations like this and first and foremost simply conclude, yes, there are atrocity crimes occurring. That is obvious. We sometimes don't know if it's precisely a war crime or precisely a crime against humanity or precisely you know, genocide at that particular moment in that particular place with those particular victims. That can be uh, investigated and is being investigated and conclusions can be drawn later. But in the meantime, policymakers have to act in response to this and not wait around for the definitions of what exactly is occurring. On genocide, Joshua, you know, a lot of inter international lawyers like myself truly are, are reaching the point where red lines of genocide are clearly being reached in Ukraine. The national people of Ukraine, the citizens with Ukrainians, uh, you know, citizenship, um, are a protected group under the Genocide Convention. And it's clear that the Russian military assault is on the Ukrainian people, the citizens of that country. Yeah. That, that is a protected group under genocide. And while you need to have the specific intent to destroy all or part of that group, um, frankly, those red lines are being met in Ukraine today. So I think it's fair now to start talking about um, genocide, and it's certainly fair for political leaders like President Biden to use that word. Um, it, there's a difference between using it politically and a difference between using it in a courtroom. The Genocide right, Convention right. is designed to prevent genocide. So politicians have to step up to the plate quickly in order to do that. Well, that's exactly what I was going to ask you about, because it was only about a week and a half ago that the UN voted to suspend Russia from its Human Rights Council. 93 nations voted in favor, 24 against, 58 abstentions, 58. So clearly, the, at least the UN, if we take that as an indicator, they're not unanimous in how they want to deal with Russia. I mean, Belarus, China, Iran, Russia, Syria, Syria were among the members that voted against that resolution. India abstained. Ambassador, what do you think is the world's appetite for doing anything about Russia? That's one of the strongest arguments or strongest concerns I hear from viewers who are saying, all of this is very nice if we can do something after thousands and thousands of people are dead. Or we can right. go in there right now and try to stop them and then prosecute whoever is left over but we're kind of crossing our fingers, hoping that the world's gonna do something. That's one of the concerns I keep hearing from people who are like, why aren't we doing more right now? Do you think the world has the appetite to do anything about Russia and, and actually try to hold its feet to the fire over all this? Well, there's a paradox at play here, Joshua. On the one hand, we've never seen such a determined effort uh, to actually punish a nation that has launched a war of aggression and atrocity crimes of such magnitude in such a short period of time, there's been a tremendous response in economic sanctions, diplomatic sanctions, cultural sports sanctions, and also providing munitions and other support to the Ukrainian military. So on the one hand, that's, that's unprecedented in such a short period of time. That's a true demonstration of, of a response of prevention under the Genocide Convention. On the other hand, we all know that it's not enough. We all know that not enough nations have actually joined in that effort. And we also know that nations, uh, NATO in particular, have declined to um, essentially exercise what we called in humanitarian law for so, much, for so long, for more than a century and a half, humanitarian intervention which would actually confront this threat head on. Under the UN Charter, we kind of tied our hands because of course, Russia and China have the veto power. And so they would veto any effort to authorize such a humanitarian intervention. Um, 
but under collective security, Ukraine has every right in self-defense to ask other nations to come to its aid. The problem is other nations have come to its aid short of the kind of action really necessary to stop those missiles from landing and to stop the Russian military from advancing and literally destroying a large percentage of the Ukrainian society. So that, that sounds a little bit like, and I'm, forgive me, forgive me, Ambassador, I'm really sorry for interrupting. I know our time is tight, but that sounds kind of yeah. like leaning more toward a military solution than a humanitarian solution. When you mentioned collective defense, that's a NATO thing. Well, collective security uh, is, is part of the NATO bonding, but of course, Ukraine is not part of, of uh, NATO, but Ukraine has the right, right under the UN Charter to seek collective self-defense. And that means calling on other nations to help it. And it has been doing that. But it hasn't taken the final step of saying, please send your forces in to help us defend this country. So there's an interesting dynamic at play here. I just think that at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, what is the fate of millions of people and of their property in Ukraine? What is their ultimate fate? And what policy do you want to, de to develop and implement in response to that ultimate fate? Ambassador David Sheffer, I appreciate you making time for us tonight, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Still to come, violent crime in America. This weekend saw four mass shootings across the country. We'll hear what crime solutions are actually working. Plus, some travelers can consider masks optional after a federal ruling. We'll let you know who's still enforcing the federal mandate, at least for now. We're glad you're with us on this Monday for Now Tonight from NBC News. Since the pandemic hit two years ago, parts of the U.S. have seen violent crime rates increase. This holiday weekend was unfortunately part of that trend. There were at least four mass shootings in the United States, one in Portland, Oregon, another in Pittsburgh, and two in South Carolina, including the state capital, Columbia. In total, at least three people died and 36 were hurt. Though, to be clear, we have no reason to believe these shootings were directly connected. All of this comes on the heels of President Biden's latest plan to curb gun violence nationwide. Since 2019, the U.S. murder rate has risen nearly 40 percent, 40 percent. So what's going on and what might help bring that rate back down? Joining us now is Randolph Roth, a crime historian and distinguished professor at The Ohio State University. He's also the author of American Homicide. Professor Roth, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. First of all, can you tell us what we're actually looking at? I feel like talking about crime, especially violent crime, is always colored by our perceptions, by the press, the stories we choose to cover, the stories that we choose to cover more heavily, what people think about what's going on around the world, and just how comfortable you feel walking out the door. What do we know is happening in the U.S. right now as it relates to violent crime? That's a really great question. And the fact is, is that we don't know much because it takes years for us to get decent data. And, um, you know, when that data comes out for 2020 to 2022, a lot of it's going to be incomplete or inaccurate. Um, so it's really tough to know exactly what is going on, where it's happening. And this is very difficult for uh, people I know in law enforcement, they don't know if what they're seeing is local, national, et cetera. Um, I think what we what happens, though, is because we have better crime statistics from cities, we see this as an urban phenomenon. But I'm not convinced it's entirely that. Um, this could be going on all across the nation. And certainly when we look at homicide trends over the since really the late 90s, um, we've seen a uh, a real rise in um, greater Appalachia uh, with the drug epidemic, where it's associated with high levels of gun ownership, lack of opportunity. Um, so we're seeing a lot more, and I bet that is going on right now, but we don't have good data right now from our rural areas. That kind of gets at something that you wrote in your book, and I want to get to a quick quote from your book. You write re with regard to homicides that they are, quote, not determined by proximate causes such as poverty, drugs, unemployment, alcohol, race, or ethnicity, 
but by factors like the feelings that people have toward their government, the degree to which they identify with members of their own communities, and the opportunities they have to earn respect without resorting to violence, unquote. This feels like yes. it gets into potentially some really kind of thorny stuff about who we are to each other and how we live. I mean, the opportunities they have to earn respect without resorting to violence, that got real vivid for me. But it doesn't get down to neat socioeconomic uh, identifiers, which kind of makes this a little more difficult to wrap your head around. Yeah, it's, it's you know, murder isn't rational. If we think about, you know, a clunky term, the legitimacy of the social hierarchy, which is really to say, can I, have I achieved what I want, what I feel I deserve in life, or can I achieve it? And what we know is with the rising rise in inequality that we've had since 1980, um, Chetty and others, uh, Opportunity Insights is their website, have discovered that the millennials are not in the uh, lower bottom half of the uh, income distribution, are not more successful than their parents. And there's a lot of downward mobility. And what I found is that you can see for European Americans, African Americans, Hispanic Americans, where um, the children of parents who are in the bottom half of the income distribution have been downwardly mobile, they're three times, those counties are three have three times the murder rate of the counties in which young people are succeeding. So where we have that where this inequality has really damaged the opportunities for people to be upwardly mobile, it's affecting not just African Americans, which is what you see in the press, it's affecting uh -huh. Hispanic Americans, European Americans, and leading to homicides. Um, and when you're frustrated, you take it out on your friends, neighbors, and acquaintances. Um, you take it out on your intimate partners. And that's the sad thing. You're angry at the world, you're upset, um, and you take it out on those most close to you, um, uh, yeah. just for tri seemingly trivial reasons. Yeah. Can I, does that make and sense? I, I do, by the way, it does. And I do want to, to I, I appreciate you mentioning taking it out on intimate partners. Domestic violence is a nexus for gun violence that doesn't get talked about enough. I think in the resurgence of the Me Too movement, more women have been kind of demanding, like, please pay attention to this. This is not just happening to happen side by side. And I think there's kind of a growing realization of that. A few other factors, one other factor in particular I wanted to get to, partly because depending on where you look, the numbers, you can pick any city and wonder whether crime is up or down. I mean, New Orleans had one of its deadliest weekends in a decade recently, and the murder rate yeah. there is up. Yeah. But in Chicago, they've had a decline in 2022 versus mm -hmm. 2021. And actually, Chicago police have had some success. They get a super bad rap. They've had some success in Chicago in terms of decreasing violent crime and homicides there. But one aspect that has been controversial there and elsewhere is police violence. How do police-involved shootings factor into our overall climate of gun homicides? Well, you know, they factor very intensely, particularly when we think about legitimacy. We don't have data on this current crisis, I said, but we do have data on the 2015-2016 um, increase in violence that occurred in the wake of Michael Brown's uh, tragic death. And that surge wasn't about drugs. It wasn't about a reluctance on the part of the police to keep policing. Um, uh, colleagues have demonstrated, as we predicted, that the spike was greatest among young African-Americans in cities where unarmed black men had been killed. Um, that fear and anger that young black men felt, their hostility, defensiveness, it spills out into everyday life. So when they feel that they've been um, attacked by the police, targeted by the police, that anger they carry with them and it leads to homicide. So yes, um, I think those police involved shootings, um, where they go wrong, um, can have a real damaging effect on our society and its social fabric. Ohio State Professor Randolph Roth. Professor, I appreciate you making time for us to explain all of this tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. We will get to some of today's other top stories in a moment, including hundreds of Starbucks workers looking to unionize. Plus, a federal judge overturned the CDC's mask mandate today for planes, trains, and buses, but... 
do you still have to wear them? And the cost of conspiracy theories gets a little too high for Alex Jones and Infowars. That's all just ahead. Stay close. The national mask mandate for mass transportation is no longer in effect after a federal ruling today. The judge overturned the federal government's mandate on planes, trains, and buses, and this ruling applies nationwide. U.S. District Judge Kith Catherine Kimball Mizell wrote that the CDC does not have the authority to enforce such a mandate. She added that the federal government failed to go through all the necessary steps in seeking public comment. It is unclear whether the Biden administration will appeal the ruling. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki responded to it today. The CDC recommended continuing the order for additional time, two weeks, uh, to be able to assess the latest science in keeping with its responsibility to protect the American people. So this is obviously a disappointing decision. The CDC continues recommending wearing a mask in public transit. Right now, the Department of Homeland Security, uh, who would be implementing, and the CDC are reviewing the decision. And of course, the Department of Justice uh, would make any determinations about litigation. Multiple airlines have said they will encourage masks, but not require them for staff or passengers. And as you heard, the CDC still recommends that travelers continue to wear them. Amtrak says it encourages masks, but it is not requiring them. However, the latest word we have from Greyhound is that it will indeed continue to require masks aboard its buses, at least for now. A few months ago, we told you about the first Starbucks to unionize. Turns out that was the beginning of a movement that is growing fast. Organizing efforts among Starbucks employees are exploding. So far, workers at more than 200 stores are getting involved across 30 states. In just the past week, more than 500 employees filed for elections. They work at 20 stores across 17 states. Some employees say that the company is trying to block them. Last week, Starbucks founder and interim CEO Howard Schultz posted an open letter he implored employees to, quote, recognize that outside labor unions are attempting to sell a very different view of what Starbucks should be, unquote. In a meeting with managers, Mr. Schultz claimed that unionized employees might not be eligible for new benefits that the company is considering. That drew a response from Workers United, the union that's seeking to represent Starbucks employees. In a statement to Fortune, the union said, quote, this is yet another indefensible threat from Starbucks. This movement is continuing to grow despite Howard Schultz's threats and bullying, unquote. In Boston, more than 28,000 runners hit the pavement for the Boston Marathon. COVID disrupted the race for the last two years, but that's not all that made this race special. This was also the 50th anniversary of the Boston Marathon admitting women. This year, Paris Jepchichir of Kenya won the pro women's title. She previously won at the Tokyo Olympics and the New York Marathon. Ms. Jepchichir is the first athlete, man or woman, to win all three of those competitions in the same year. Kenyan runners also dominated the men's pro division, sweeping the top three spots. Evans Chubet won the race in two hours and six minutes. 20-year-old Henry Richard also crossed the finish line today. He ran the marathon for the first time in memory of his brother, Martin, who was killed in the 2013 Boston Marathon bombings. His brother was just eight years old at the time. That attack also cost Adrian Hazlitt her left foot. But today she returned to the starting line. And this was just the second time that the Boston Marathon featured a paradivision, partly because of Ms. Hazlitt's advocacy. The internet company run by Alex Jones is in trouble, bankrupted after conspiracy theories landed him in court. Infowars has filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. Alex Jones faced multiple defamation lawsuits last year. He falsely claimed that the Sandy Hook Elementary School mass shooting was fake. But back in 2012, 20 children and six educators were, in fact, killed during the attack in Newtown, Connecticut. Some victims' families have already won lawsuits against Mr. Jones. But filing for bankruptcy pauses the civil litigation until he reorganizes his finances. According to the court filing, InfoWars has as many as $50,000 in assets. Its liabilities are as high as $10 million. 
coming up. Today's the last day to file your taxes, but a major backlog has the IRS on a hiring spree. We'll explain when we come back. Tax day is today. Maybe you already know that. You're listening to me with like half an ear, scrambling to file before the deadline, like, shut up, Josh, I'm going as fast as I can. I know, I know. I know you're scrambling. But it turns out the IRS is scrambling too. Government accountants have millions of returns to process, including mine and yours, but they don't have enough people to get it done. And that is why the IRS is on a major hiring spree. NBC Business and Technology correspondent Jolene Kent has more on that. It's tax deadline day, and even if you are on top of your taxes, it doesn't necessarily mean the IRS will be, especially if you're looking for a refund. Right now, the IRS, like so many restaurants and stores nationwide, is understaffed. They're looking to hire 10,000 people right now and into the rest of this year. The idea is to hire up on the entry-level positions, like tax examiners and clerks, starting at $15 an hour, because they currently have an individual tax return backlog of 6 million returns as of the beginning of tax season. That's 5 million more than normal. And so they need to staff up to start processing and clearing that backlog in addition to processing your returns right now. This comes after the IRS has had a history of being starved of funding by the federal government and, of course, all kinds of technical issues with out-of-date technology. The Biden administration currently has an $80 billion proposal to Congress to fund more of the IRS to solve some of these problems, but so far that really hasn't moved much on Capitol Hill. So the idea here going into this tax deadline day is if you're not filing an extension, you're trying to get that refund, be sure to file electronically to help yourself. Make sure you don't make any mistakes. And as you submit those final returns, just be very meticulous. And right now, the turnaround time is about 21 days, according to the IRS, for 9 out of 10 returns. So the turnaround time isn't so bad, but the IRS still saying and hedging that they are cautiously optimistic when it comes to whether or not they can compete and hire the 10,000 workers they need. All right. Thank you, Joe. That's NBC's Jolene Kent with the story. And let's continue now with Janet Holtzblatt, senior fellow at the Tax Policy Center. Ms. Holtzblatt, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me here tonight. I am positive that as soon as we started talking about this, someone in our audience was like, here's the world's tiniest violin for the IRS. Like, of all the government agencies that I'm going to cry over, wait, uh, no, lost a tear. Like, why is this a thing <laughs> for those who have zero love for the IRS? Why should anybody care about how long it takes the IRS to get all the tax returns done? Well, there's two reasons they should care. One is they want their money back, and so investing in the IRS can ensure that they get their refund more quickly. And the second reason is that the money that's collected by the IRS goes to pay for so many of the services that we count on. Uh, so you do want the money to be coming in and in a timely fashion so it's available to pay for our Social Security, our you know, higher education subsidies, and so forth. So the IRS serves a very important function in this country. But yeah, it's one of the least loved agencies in the government. I wonder what you think, and of course, forgive my flippance, I was, I was just being cheeky, but no. in terms of why the IRS is so understaffed and underfunded, expand on that just a little bit. How did we get to this point? Um, well, it's partly rooted in the fact that the IRS isn't loved. So for the last 10 years, 11 years, Congress has repeatedly cut the IRS's budget. Since 2010 through 2021, after adjusting for uh, inflation, the IRS's budget has been cut by over 20%. Now, there are two implications of that. One place where the IRS uh, got deep cuts was in staffing. Over seven years of that period, there was a hiring freeze. And that hiring freeze couldn't have come as a worse time because the IRS was, um, their employees were aging, they were reaching retirement age, and they were leaving and these were experienced workers and they could not be replaced. So that was a real brain drain. And then the second um, aspect was technology. Um, your reporter alluded to that. In some cases, the IRS is still relying on programming languages that are over half a century old. 
Um, and then with that weakening infrastructure, I'm sorry, wait, I, 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 forgive me for forgive me for interrupting you. I, it sounded like you said the IRS is relying on computer programming languages that are over a half century old. Did I hear you right? Yes. I mean, not entirely. What computer? Like, are yes, they are they using vacuum computer. tubes? I didn't even know there were any computer languages that were well, older. Well, if you recall than... Cobalt, Cobalt, uh, Cobalt, yeah. Um, yeah. They're I using mean, COBOL? Really, since I have been in this business, the IRS has been seeking to modernize their computers. When I first started, they were trying to get into the 20th century or late 20th century, and now they're trying to get into the 21st century. And that's a problem. It, it causes delays in terms, it causes issues for the processing of returns. It causes issues for selection of returns for audits. It causes issues for taxpayer services. It needs to be brought up to speed, and that requires a long-term commitment to IRS's funding, knowing that they can have the money in the next, not just money today, but you know, funding for future years so they can make those kind of investments in its infrastructure. I, 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 yeah, I'm still wrapping my head around them programming in COBOL. That's a language I didn't know that anybody knew except for people with a Rosetta Stone. I didn't even know people knew how to translate from COBOL anymore. Uh, you'd be Before, surprised how ancient some of the programs are across DC. I, I guess so. I guess so. Bef I know I got to let you go in a second, but yeah, I, <laughs> I know I got to let you go in a second, but suppose there is someone out there who's looking and they're like, I can help solve this problem. Like, I would like to be part of the organization. There's no dishonor in working for the United States government and serving your fellow citizens. Maybe this is something I want to do. What kind of person does it take to, to work at the IRS, to do the work that needs to be done? The IRS is recruiting at every single level. Um, you need people to be able to answer the phones, to handle taxpayers' questions. You need people to be uh, processing, the, you know, helping with the processing of paper returns. A lot of those are entry-level jobs. You also need people for higher, um, higher level jobs. The IRS has also lost a lot of its examiners, the people who handle some of the most complicated tax returns. And for those uh, jobs, you do need people who have CPAs, uh, preferably people who have some experience. The workforce has diminished at all levels in all positions. So there are entry-level jobs available there, and there are jobs for people who have the experience to handle uh, the challenging returns filed by corporations and wealthy people. I will say, just in the interest of helping out, if you go to irs.gov, their homepage, there's a link that says IRS is hiring. The IRS has a virtual hiring fair coming up on April 28th. They're also hiring for people in Guaynabo, in Puerto Rico, in Philadelphia, in Memphis, Tennessee. The historically black sorority Delta Sigma Theta is trying to help the IRS with hiring. So there are a lot of opportunities to get involved there if you want to. IRS.gov and then just click on IRS is hiring. It's on the homepage. Janet Holtzblatt of the Tax Policy Center. Appreciate you making time. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me here. Shooting satellites out of space. The weapons to do that are real. And now the Biden administration is banning itself from developing them. But will other nations do the same? We'll get to that before we go. It sounds like something a James Bond villain would do. Shoot satellites out of the sky. But space-based and space-targeting weapons are real. The U.S. is trying to get other nations to ban anti-satellite weapons. Today, it took the first step by banning itself from using them. This comes after Russia tested such a missile last November. It created more than 1,500 pieces of space debris. According to a press release from NASA, the attack also endangered the International Space Station. Vice President Kamala Harris made the announcement today at Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. The United States will continue to be a leader in order to establish, to advance, and demonstrate norms for the responsible and peaceful use of outer space. We are the first nation to make such a commitment. And today, on behalf of the United States of America, I call on all nations to join us whether 
a nation is spacefaring or not. Let's get into all of this with NBC National Security correspondent Ken Delanian. And Ken, we're talking about direct ascent anti-satellite missile testing. What exactly are we referring to? Is it just like shooting a missile out of a satellite out of the sky with a missile from the ground, or is there more to it than that? It's just a fancy way of talking about um, destroying a satellite by essentially bumping something forcefully into it. Generally, it's a missile launched from the ground. And there have only been a, three of these tests that we know of. Uh, the first one was by the United States back in 1985. Um, China did one in 2007. And then, of course, this most recent, very disturbing one that you referred to by Russia in November that created all this space debris. And that really got everybody's attention because um, what experts say is it created a hazardous debris field that actually puts at risk other satellites, even you know people on the International Space Station, because those things, that debris doesn't go away. It, it stays in orbit and, and travels really fast and poses a risk. And so the United States is taking this step. It's a voluntary unilateral ban, trying to essentially lead by example and saying, we will not do these tests anymore, and we hope that no other country will do them. Of course, that remains to be seen whether that will happen, Joshua. As you mentioned, China and Russia have already tested weapons like this. We understand that Iran and North Korea may be developing or trying to improve some kind of anti-satellite weapon. How big a thing is this in terms of all the different kinds of geopolitical and strategic threats that the U.S. and other nations face from China and Russia and Iran and North Korea and elsewhere? How do these kinds of space-based weapons rank among those threats? Well, the whole issue of the militarization of space is actually a big deal that doesn't get as much attention as it should. And you know, our colleague Tom Costello recently got an exclusive uh, look at uh, US Space Command, and he went in inside the headquarters and looked at the classified room where they are tracking uh, threats to US satellites. So much of what the US military does, and in fact, what our society does, um, it relies on satellites that are orbiting the Earth. And to the extent that Russia and China and potentially Iran, North Korea have or develop weapons that threaten those satellites, that's a big deal. That's a, a major, significant military national security threat. And so the U.S. government is really trying to marshal resources um, to protect against that threat. And they're also using diplomacy. And this is an example of a, of a kind of a diplomatic uh, entreaty here to try to see if they can um, end these kind of dangerous um, anti-satellite weapons tests. I do recall that piece by Tom Costello. I'm going to ask our team if we could to share that out on social, because that really was a fascinating piece, especially since, I think, because, you know, it was one of the things the Trump administration unveiled, and people were kind of like, yeah, Space Force, the logo kind of looks like Starfleet Command. Like, people didn't take it really seriously at first, but this is actually a significant concern for the future of war fighting. So since this is such a real concern, what's the read on whether or not the U.S.'s self-imposed ban is going to bear any fruit. I mean, are nations like China and Russia going to respond favorably to that? Will they ignore it? What's the smart money on that? Most experts uh, we've spoken to and, and politicians, U.S. lawmakers, believe that China and Russia will, in fact, ignore this, will not, will not follow the U.S. wishes. I guess the, the design here is to sort of set an example and, and kind of shame our adversaries into eventually possibly uh, coming along and maybe negotiating a treaty, as they did with the nuclear test ban treaty back in the 1960s. Of course, that was negotiated with the Soviet Union and announced all at once time before there was no unilateral U.S. ban in that case. In this case, there's really no hope that Russia in the middle of a war in Ukraine is going to go along with a U.S. You know, voluntary ban on satellite weapons testing. And so uh, the United States is trying to set international norms here and hope that at least sort of allied friendly nations will go along and potentially develop a body of law, body of diplomatic practice around satellite weapons. Joshua. I know I got to let you go in a second, Ken, but I'm really fascinated, fascinated to know how the U.S.'s strategy on this is going to evolve. I mean, the Space Force, from what I understand, is mostly meant to be defensive, although the offensive capabilities in space are still kind of shaking themselves out. What is that looking like? Like, is the U.S. looking to establish space-based presences around the globe for American defense, or is it still kind of in a defensive, negotiating, diplomatic posture right now before we go? 
So you're asking exactly the right question, Joshua, because of course the United States is the most capable nation in space. We have the most advanced space technology. And so while the Defense Department's posture on this, their public posture is, oh, this is all defensive. We, are, we don't want a war in space. We're completely doing all this to make sure our adversaries can't attack us. Other countries, of course, suspect that the US has very advanced satellite, anti-satellite weapons, and they worry that the United States is, is militarizing space. And that's the kind of the debate, the frame here, but the U.S. is saying, no, this is wholly defensive on our part, Joshua. Thank you, Ken. That's NBC National Security correspondent Ken Delaney with the latest on that. And hey, thank you for making time for us as well. Do follow us online for the latest topics and guests. Also, remember we mentioned that federal overturning of the transportation mask mandate? Let us know how that goes for you if you hit the road. We're at NBC Now tonight on social media. Feel free to leave us a voicemail or send us an email. But until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. Thanks for watching. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.